So good morning, everybody. Welcome to this um, third day of the national meeting of the Portuguese Mathematical Society. Uh, it's my really great pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to introduce Gonçalo Taboada from the Universidade Nova de Lisboa and Warwick University. Uh, Gonçalo is a leading figure. He has many distinctions and, and awards, and he's done made many important contributions in uh, both algebraic geometry and algebraic topology. Uh, in particular, he has uh, important work in uh, non-commutative motives, K-theory, homological algebra, etc. and I could continue for, for quite a while. Um, but it's probably better to let Gonzalo speak for himself. So um, just before giving the word to Gonzalo, I would like to encourage the, uh, the audience. Uh, I know there are several hundreds of you out there. Uh, I've been told by the organizers. So uh, please use the, um, the panel for asking questions uh, on the right of, your, of, the, of the screen. And then at the end, I'll pass the questions on to Gonzalo. So Gonzalo, please, uh, stage is yours. Thank you so much, Peter, for these kind words. And uh, good morning to everyone out there. Uh, I would like to start, of course, by thanking the organizers for uh, the invitation to speak at this event. It's a, it's a great pleasure and a great honor. And also, I uh, would like to wish uh, an happy birthday to the Portuguese Mathematical Society. It's really one of those cases where the older, the better. So um, I, I'm going to talk about the Jack Titz motivic measure. So let me share my screen. Uh, no. OK. Um, and I try to prepare this talk in order to be as didactic as possible. So please ask questions. So in order to make the, the exposition more interactive. OK, so uh, we'll start uh, with the base field. Little k will stand for uh, our base field. And I'll denote by var k. So this will stand for the category. Uh, of algebraic varieties uh, define over k, so algebraic k varieties. And I start right away with uh, the main definition, which is the definition of the Grothendieck ring of varieties. And uh, we'll denote it like this, k0 var k. Let me just mention that this ring was introduced in a letter uh, from Grothendieck uh, from Grothendieck to Serre. It was a letter about 40 years ago, sorry, about 60 years ago. Uh, it was 16 of August of 1964, in fact. And uh, it's pretty easy to define this group. So it's defined by generators and relations. Um, so what are the generators? So the generators, we have an isomorphism class. Uh, so an isomorphism class for every uh, algebraic variety. So we just take the free abelian group on these isomorphism classes. So that's a monster, it's huge. And then we take uh, relations. So we mod out by certain relations. And what are those relations? They say the following, that x and uh, it's equal to z plus x except z. So whenever uh, z is a closed subscheme, a closed algebraic subvariety of x. So in terms of a picture, we have x, we have our closed subschemes z, and we have the complement. Um, and what we are saying is that uh, we are considering some, what is usually called the Caesar relations. So these relations are usually called the Caesar relations. Why? Because the idea is that if you, if you, if you have a Caesar, you can go on x, you, you cut z, remove z and you take z and its complement and in the Grothendieck ring of varieties having the original x or z and its complement is the same information. So of course what you lose is the way that these two pieces are glued together but in the Grothendieck ring of varieties you lose this information. So these relations really kill a lot of information 
And it turns out that uh, this abelian group comes equipped with a multiplication, uh, multiplication, and uh, is defined as you expect. So how do you multiply two Grotten D classes? Well, by definition, you just take the Cartesian part product of your algebraic varieties. So in, in this way, you get a ring. Let me make just some remarks about this ring. Uh, the zero of this ring is actually the Grotten D class of the empty variety. The one, uh, the multiplicative unity, it's actually the Grotten D class of a point. So by a point, I mean spec of K. And uh, yeah, and one important uh, element of this ring is actually the Grotten D class of the affine line. So that's what we usually denote by L. And let me recall you that the affine line is just the, by definition, the spec of the ring of polynomials. Okay, and in order to get a feeling about this ring, let me make just one quick computation so you have an idea how does it work, how, uh, how does it work. Uh, just one second. Okay, okay, so, uh, so let's make just a computation. So for example, if we take the projective line, so it's well known that the projective line is obtained from the affine line by adding a point at infinity. So here we have a point and then we have the affine line. So we glue a point at infinity to the affine line, you get the projective line. So with this description, we immediately see that the Grotten D class of the affine line is actually given by L plus one. Okay, how about the higher dimensional projective spaces? Well, they are obtained in a similar fashion. So you, you actually have a copy of the projective space of dimension n minus one, and you glue a copy of a n, and you glue it in a non-trivial way. So these are the two pieces which are glued in a non-trivial way. And so that implies that the Grotten D class of p n is actually given by the Grotten D class of a n, but well, a n is a one times a one n times, so it's actually l n, and then you get the Grotten D class of p n minus one, and now you see that you you can do some induction here because this is going to be equal to l minus one plus the Grotten D class of p minus two, and then you can continue. And at the very end, what you'll end up, it's well, L uh, power N plus L power N minus one until you get to the L plus one. So you get this, this computation, okay? So you see that uh, it only matters uh, what the pieces are, not how they are glued together. So this, uh, this Grotendieck ring of varieties, uh, is actually a very uh, complicated. Uh, it's actually uh, also very mysterious object. I would like to emphasize this. Um, so it, 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 this uh, Grotten Dick ring of varieties, which plays a an important role in algebraic geometry, for example, in motivic integration. Uh, well, it's uh, it's it's extremely complicated, and we don't know much about it. There are many open conjectures and questions about it about this this object. Uh, and today, I just would like to focus on a very particular a aspect of this of this uh, ring, namely. Uh, if we have two algebraic varieties which are isomorphic, then by definition, we know that the Grotten Dick classes are the same. But today, I, would, I just would like to focus on the converse implication. So, what can we say about the converse implication? So, is it true or not that uh, if the Grotten Dick classes are the same, you actually the varieties are isomorphic? So, one shouldn't expect to be true. In fact, it's general 
uh, it's false in general. And it's not easy to see that it's false in general. For example, uh, you can take uh, for x uh, the fine line, and you can take for y uh, the cusp. So uh, just the, the curve defined uh, by the equation uh, where you have y cubed minus x squared. So, and geometrically, you can think about something like this something like this. So these two algebraic varieties, they are not isomorphic. One is smooth, the other is not even smooth. But uh, in the Grothendieck ring of varieties, they are in fact the same. They have the same Grothendieck class. Why is that? Well, simply because I can, I have a partition on both sides. So uh, I, can, I can find this piece on this side and this piece on this side. And also I can find this piece on this side and this so this piece in yellow on, on the left-hand side, sorry. And this piece on yellow on the right-hand side. And these pieces are actually the same. So the difference is that the way you glue the pieces on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side is different. But the pieces are the same. So in the Grothendieck class, in the Grothendieck ring, these two uh, algebraic varieties have the same Grothendieck class. So they, they become the same. So this is a general phenomena whenever you can find a partition of an algebraic variety and then glue those pieces in a different way, you get a different algebraic variety, but the Grothendieck class does not change, some kind of Lego phenomena. And another phenomena that occurs here in the, in the Grothendieck ring of varieties is the following, is sometimes it happens that you have two algebraic varieties which are not isomorphic, but you can find a higher dimensional algebraic variety, you can embed them in a common uh, higher dimension algebraic variety uh, in such a way that uh, when you look at the complements of both of them on this ambient higher dimension algebraic variety, they have the same Grothendieck class. For example, they are actually isomorphic. But if this, this is the case, then you see that the Grothendieck class of X, which is the Grothendieck class of the ambient space minus the complement, it's going to be equal because they have the same uh, Grothendieck class of the complement. They're going to be equal to the Grothendieck class of Y. So you see this is another kind of phenomena that occurs and where, two, where you have two algebraic varieties which are not isomorphic, but have the same Grothendieck class. So it's not only general, it's really general. It's not only false, the converse implication, it's extremely false and there's no reason for it to, to be true. And the, the, the point today I would like to emphasize, so today, so I'm just going to talk today about this feature, which is that in fact, and surprisingly, it's actually true uh, in many cases. So, this implication is true in many cases, which is surprising. Okay, so uh, if we want to study this, this Grothendieck ring of varieties, uh, what we need to do is to find invariants um, that descend to this Grothendieck ring of varieties so that we can actually distinguish Grothendieck classes. And that is the, the notion of a motivic measure. So let me just recall you this, this, this definition. So what is a a motivic measure. So a motivic measure. Uh, so this is nothing but a, a ring homomorphism. It's just a ring homomorphism uh, mu uh, going from the Grothendieck ring of varieties uh, to a ring. Just that, for example, so the, the classical motivic measures that one can find in the literature is Suppose that your base field is finite. So in that case, you can you have a counting motivic measure. So you, in this case, it goes to Z. And if you have an algebraic variety, what, what can you do? Well, you, you look at its points over K, over this finite field, and you count how many of them. And this procedure actually uh, satisfies or preserves these uh, Caesar relations because, well, if you have z, then the number of points of x is actually the sum of the number of points on z and on the complement. 
So it gives rise to a well-defined motivic measure. And in, the, in, in a, another classical example is that we, if you are working over C, so in that case, you have a Euler characteristic motivic measure also with values in, in, in Z. Uh, so in this case, what do you do? Well, if you have your algebraic variety defined over uh, the complex numbers, you can take the complex points, then you just have a complex manifold. If you have a complex manifold, you can look at its cohomology, let's say with Q coefficients and with compact support. And then you can, take, you can extract this dimension, so that's a, an integer. And then uh, simply what you do is that you take uh, an alternating sum um, of these numbers and you, you, you end up with an integer. Okay, so that's, that procedure also preserves this Caesar uh, relation. Okay, you see these motivic measures here. Uh, since the target is pretty simple, that means that you can actually compute. But at the same time, that tells you that the kernel of these motivic measures is huge. So in, pr in principle, they will not distinguish uh, too many uh, Grotendi classes. Okay, so it would be interesting to find a motivic measure where you have the correct balance between these two things. So uh, an interesting target and at, such that the kernel uh, is not so large, but at the same time that you can actually compute, okay? And this is what I want to mention today. Uh, so let me just uh, state the main theorem. So statement of results. Uh, so now I'm going to be uh, what people in mathematics usually call very abstract. I'm going to be very abstract, state the main theorem, and then I'll be really focused on the applications which are, uh, as people usually say, quite concrete, okay? Uh, so the field uh, will work over a base field and it will be of characteristic zero. And if we have an algebra, uh, if we have a field, then you can take its absolute Galois group. So you take the absolute Galois group, okay? And now I need uh, two notations in order to state the theorem. First notation, I will look at uh, a subring of the ring of, uh, of uh, algebraic varieties. So it's the subring uh, where I'll write TW of twisted. It's the smallest uh, subring uh, of the Grotendieck ring of varieties, okay, containing uh, the following Grotendieck classes. So you take a, a homogeneous projective variety and you twist it by a one co-cycle. So let me make this more precise. So G, it's an algebraic group, uh, which I'm going to assume to be split and moreover uh, semi-simple. And P will be a parabolic. And uh, uh, gamma will be an element of the first uh, cohomology group of this uh, group with coefficients in G bar, okay, bar. Okay, so it's a one co-cycle of this cohomology. So this is the kind of uh, algebraic varieties I'm going to be interested in, twists of uh, projective homogeneous varieties. And the second notation is the target of my motivic measure. Uh, it's the following ring, which I'll denote by uh, R, B, K. So it's a quotient of, uh, so you can first look at the Brouwer group of K. So this is the Brouwer group of your base field. And then if you have a group, you can take its group, uh, the group ring associated to it. So uh, finite linear combinations with integer coefficients on the Brouwer group. And then I'm going to mod out by the following relations. So you, if you have K and then plus A tensor B uh, minus the Brouwer class of A minus the Brouwer class of B. And this, whenever you have two central simple algebras, A and B, uh, such that its indexes are co-prime to each other. Okay, so you have this group, uh, which might seem a bit strange, uh, and now the theorem, the main theorem is the following. 
is that in fact we have a, a well-defined a well-defined uh, motivic measure um, which I call the Jack Tietz motivic measure. It's not defined on the entire uh, Grotten Dick ring of varieties but only in this sub ring uh, okay, generated by the twisted projective homogeneous varieties and it's, uh, it takes values in this group in this ring and what it does is that if you have a twisted projective homogeneous variety, uh, well, whenever you twist a projective homogeneous variety, you get uh, algebras, which are what called the Jack Tietz uh, algebras. Uh, and then what you can look at the Grotendieck, uh, the Brouwer class of these algebras, and then do the sum of all of them. There will be a finite number of them. So you get an element in this bizarre ring and you get a, a ring homomorphism and the, the theorem is saying that this is actually a well-defined motivic measure, okay? This uh, uses uh, a lot of technology, for example, the, the recent theory of non-commutative models, okay? Okay, this is, uh, might seem very abstract. So now what I want to do is just to give applications of this in order to make this much more concrete. But let me just mention that the idea here is that this motivic measure, uh, the kernel is not so big, so we can actually distinguish a lot of uh, Grotten Dieck classes. So that's the point, in contrast with the, the previous motivic measures where the kernel was huge, you cannot distinguish much. Okay, so first application, so application number one, and it's the it's an application to what is called the Severy Brouwer varieties. So let me start by defining what is a Severy Brouwer variety. Uh, so this is an algebraic variety defined over K. Okay, let's say that it has dimension uh, n. And is such that so it's it's called a Severy Brow variety. So it's called a Severy Brow variety. If when you base change, so from so it's defined over k. When you go to the algebraic closure, when you go to k bar, then it becomes isomorphic to the projective space of the same dimension, in this case, n, defined on k-bar. So this algebraic variety is not the projective space, but when you go to the algebraic closure, it becomes the, the projective space. So some remarks about this, uh, these uh, varieties. It turns out it follows from the definition that they are always smooth and projective. And moreover, they, they are actually the projective space defined over k, if and only if, uh, your algebraic variety actually has a k rational point. So they are algebraic varieties that you somehow you do not see because they don't have k rational points. You only see them when you go to the algebraic closure and they become the projective space. So let me be, give a very simple example. Suppose that we are working over the reals. In that case, you can look at x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals zero. So this is a curve inside of P2, and uh, it's a well-defined equation. It's a well-defined algebraic variety, but it has no, uh, it has no R rational points. So there are no solutions to this equation, but this algebraic variety, when you base change to C, it becomes the projective space, the projective line, in fact, the P1 becomes the P1. But over R, there are not there are not even points. Okay, so it's this kind of algebraic varieties that I'm going to address in this application, and it turns out that there is a dictionary between this geometry of these varieties and algebra. So let me explain this dictionary because I'm going to need it. So the I need the following definition. So uh, so now I move on to to algebra. So I say that uh, a finite dimensional a finite dimensional k-algebra A, A, so it's called um, central, 
So you say that it's central if the center of A, so the center of A are the elements of A which commute uh, with all other elements of uh, A, so with, res uh, with respect to multiplication, consists solely of your base field K. So it's something extremely non-commutative. And moreover, it's, you say that it's simple if uh, there are no, so if A has no uh, non-trivial uh, two-sided uh, two ideals. Okay, so just the zero and A itself are the only two-sided ideals that you can find inside of A, okay? So it turns out that uh, these algebras, they exist and their dimension is always a square, so you can take its square roots, and this it's what we call the degree of our algebra. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are the kind, the simplest examples of uh, what are the simplest examples of central simple algebras? Well, uh, the simplest examples are, are uh, when the degree is actually equal to two, so uh, a central simple algebra. Uh, okay, algebra A uh, of degree two uh, is called uh, a quaternion algebra. So degree two means that it's of something of dimension four. So these are the simplest examples that we can find. Of course, we can find little k, the base field, and then afterwards are the quaternion algebras. So let me just recall you what are the quaternion algebras because they are going to be useful. The construction is as follows. You start with two invertible elements of your field and you construct an algebra which we denote by AB and it's defined as follows. So it's something four dimensional. So uh, you have you consider the four dimensional uh, k vector space uh, with a basis uh, given by one u v and w. So you just have a four dimensional k vector space, and on this four dimensional k vector space, I'm going to define a multiplication. Um, and uh, how do you define this multiplication? Well, you declare this element to be the the two-sided um, unity with regards to multiplication. Uh, you say you force the square of u to be a, the square of v to be b, and then all the other possibilities of multiplication, you can consider the following mnemonic. You just have u, v, and w. You consider the clockwise direction. So. Uh, you consider the clockwise direction. Here you put one, here you put a minus b, here you put minus a, and from this you can extract all the other multiplication rules. For example, uh, how what is v multiplied by w? So if when you go from v to w, you go in the correct direction, in other words, the clockwise direction. So you get the, the third element, so you get u, and then the scalar that you get is the scalar that you have between v and w, so in this case it's minus b. But if you do it on the other uh, order, you're going from uh, w to v, so you're going in the wrong direction, you still get u, but you're going to, to multiply by a minus because you are going in the wrong direction, and then the scalar that you have there, so it's actually it's bu. So you see uh, that here, you see immediately that it's a non-commutative algebra, okay? And from here you can get all the other uh, multiplications, okay? So these are the quaternion algebras, just this. And maybe a historical remark uh, uh, is that the Hamilton, uh, Hamilton's uh, quaternion, quaternions, uh, so which Hamilton discovered 200 years ago, so in 1843. Uh, so that is the case where the base field is the reals and the uh, Hamilton's quaternions is just the algebra minus one, minus one. Okay, you get, you start with this general definition. In this particular case, you get Hamilton's definition, okay? So this is the, what I wanted to say about algebra. And now what is the, the dictionary between algebra and geometry, okay? 
So there is this dictionary, dictionary um, that says the following. On the one side, you have the central simple algebras, the central simple uh, K algebras A uh, of degree uh, D, and you consider them up to isomorphism. And this is in bijection, so in one one to correspondence with the Savery Brouwer varieties. So the Savery Brouwer varieties, uh, X of dimension uh, equal to uh, D minus one. And again, up to isomorphism. So there is this dictionary between geometry on the right hand side and algebra on the left hand side. And if you have an algebra here, the corresponding Savery Brouwer variety is usually denoted like this. So it's the SB of A. Okay, I'm not telling you, uh, I'm not describing you this dictionary, but I'm going to describe it in the particular case of uh, D equals two. So if you take D equals two, in other words, if you take uh, the left hand side the corresponds to quaternion algebras. So if you take the quaternion algebras where A and B are invertible elements and you consider them up to isomorphism, they are in one-to-one -one correspondence. I'm going to need some more space here. So they are in one-to-one -one correspondence, one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, conics. So they are curves in P2 which are concretely given by a uh, x square plus b y square minus z square equals zero. This inside of P2, so you have this conic inside of P2, and you let a and b vary in this uh, invertible elements, and you consider them up to isomorphism. So you see that the quaternion algebras that I just defined above, geometrically, they correspond to, to the conics, okay? So all this work, all these definitions to arrive to the following application. So it's the, this theorem that says the following, that we have uh, an inclusion. So we have an inclusion. Uh, on the left-hand side, we can look at Savery Brouwer varieties, okay? Uh, where we have a restriction on A, we impose that the Brouwer class of A to be two torsion, so in the, it lives in the two torsion part of the Brouwer group. And you consider that up to isomorphism, this it's included in the Grothendieck ring of varieties. So this uh, is giving you an, uh, somehow uh, an answer. Or, uh, okay. Sometimes this happens. Apologize. So this gives you an answer uh, to the to this implication that I'm after. So this converse implication. So this is the case where you have algebraic varieties which are not isomorphic, and when you look at the corresponding Rotundi classes, they remain different. Okay. So this is what's happening with all these uh, examples here. So all these every Brouwer varieties, as long as the Brouwer class is two torsion. Then, when you go to the to the Grothendieck group, they remain different. So there are no possibilities of finding partitions and gluing the pieces, or going to higher dimensional uh, varieties, etc. Those kind of phenomena do not occur among those. So let me now be more. Uh, let me give just a corollary of this. So a corollary would be if you take the particular case where A is actually of degree two. So if the degree is two. The, the period is two, in other words, the torsion is two. So in that case, that means that these conics that I just defined, if you take these conics with A and B uh, invertible elements and you consider them up to isomorphism, they embed in this Grothendieck ring of varieties. So all these conics here, um, they are different among themselves and they embed in the Grothendieck ring of varieties. And this, of course, depends how many they are, that depends on your base field. So for example, if we are over R, so it's in this case, there are only two conics. So you have this conic here, uh, where you have just uh, X square plus Y square minus Z square equals zero. So this is nothing but uh, 
the projective line, so this is P1, and you have another one that is C minus one minus one, so the one given corresponding to the, to the quaternions of Hamilton, and this is the, the conic given by uh, minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared equals zero. So here you see that as I mentioned, as I previously mentioned, there are no R rational points, okay? So these two conics are not isomorphic. One of them doesn't have even R rational points. And when you go to the Grothendieck ring of varieties, they remain different there, okay? And this is, uh, you only have two of them because of the simplicity of R, but if you go to other uh, fields, for example, the rationals, uh, then you have a lot of examples, for example, all the conics minus 1p, um, which are the conics uh, minus x squared plus p y squared minus z squared equals zero. So this parameterized by all the primes which are congruent to 3 mod 4. So this is a, a family here. Um, of conics defined over Q, and they are in fact pairwise uh, non isomorphic. Okay, uh, and there are actually an infinite number of primes which are congruent to 3 mod 4, so you have an infinite family of pairwise non isomorphic conics, none of them has a Q rational point, and when you go to the, to the Grothendieck ring of rights, they remain all different again. Of course, they have uh, R rational points. Uh, so, for example, the, this point here where you have the square root of p, 1, and 0, this is a point because uh, you, you can solve the equation uh, like this. So, plus p times 1 square minus 0 square. Okay, so that you actually need the square root, so you actually need to go to the reals, not over the, the rational numbers. Okay? This is just one of the many applications. Let me mention another application. Uh, um, another application is, uh, application number two is to uh, twisted Grassmannians. Um, so if you have a central simple algebra, uh, and you have an integer between one and the degree of your central simple algebra, uh, one thing that you can do is you can construct a Grassmannian of n-dimensional planes, and you can twist it with the central simple algebra. So this becomes more explicit with two examples. Um, so first example, when you take the trivial central simple algebra of degree d, so this is just the matrix algebra d by d on your base field, then in this case, the Grassmannian uh, that you are twisting by this A, so A is trivial, is the trivial central simple algebra. This is just the classical Grassmannian of n planes in the d-dimensional space. Okay, so if you just use the trivial central simple algebra, you just have the Grassmannian. And in the other direction is that if you take n equals to one, then in that case, the Grassmannian, the twisting by A is just the savory brow variety of A. So, Savory Brown varieties are twists of the projective space. And here, what I'm doing is that I'm twisting Grassmannians, okay, using central simple algebras. Okay? And for this kind of uh, objects, we also have the, the same application as before. So we also have uh, an inclusion. So we have an inclusion. Uh, so you can look at all Grassmannians twisted by central simple algebra, and you have this restriction on A, the Brouwer class, to be two torsion. And if you take them up to isomorphism, then this embeds in the Grothendieck ring of varieties. So this theorem is actually a far-reaching generalization of the previous theorem here, okay? Because the, the savory brow varieties is the particular case with n equals one, okay? Where you just doing the model I space of, of lines, okay? Okay, so you see that uh, all these kind of algebraic varieties, they remain different in the Grothendieck uh, ring. Another application, application number three, 
uh, is to quadrix. So quadric uh, hypersurfaces. Um, so let me recall you that when you have a quadratic form, uh, when you have a quadratic form, uh, that we always assume to be non-degenerate and also uh, to be to have a trivial discriminant uh, then we can look at the corresponding uh, quadric hypersurface inside the projective space of dimension equal to the dimension of the of q minus 1 okay and uh, the theorem uh, it's again a theorem in the same spirit is that we have an inclusion Uh, so we can take the quadric hypersurfaces and we have this restriction on the dimension of uh, the quadratic form to be 6. In other words, we are looking at uh, quadric hypersurfaces of dimension 4 in P5. And you consider them up to isomorphism. Then this embeds in the Grothendieck ring of varieties. So again, all these things remain distinct in the Grothendieck ring of varieties. But it's interesting because this left-hand side actually can be made very explicit. Uh, so the quadrics here are actually the following ones. So it's A, uh, sorry, A, um, so it's A u square plus B v square minus A B uh, w square minus A prime x square minus B prime y square plus a prime b prime z square equals zero. So you have this quadric hypersurface inside of P5, and you let a and b and a prime and b prime vary in your, in your field. So they are units of your field, and you consider this up to isomorphism. So concretely, are those very concrete uh, quadric hypersurfaces? And now, of course, it depends how many do you have, depends on the on your on your base field, uh, once again, let's say that we are over R. Well, in this case, uh, you have two of them. So you have U square plus V square minus W square minus X square square plus X square equals zero. So you have this one, which is not isomorphic to this one. Um, uh, Okay, so for example, in the case, if you are working over the reals, you only have two of them. Uh, they are, they are non-isomorphic and they remain distinct in the Grothendieck ring of varieties. But if, if you go to uh, fields which are, are uh, more complicated from the arithmetic viewpoint, then you have uh, lots of examples. Um, so for example, you have this uh, family of quadric hypersurfaces uh, in P5, okay, uh, parameterized by P, once again, a prime number congruent to 3 mod 4. And uh, they are, all of them, they are pairwise uh, non isomorphic. Okay, all of them remain distinct, the Grothendieck classes. And the theorem is actually stronger than this. Uh, this restriction on the dimension of the quadratic form can be uh, removed as long as the, so let me make a remark. So a generalization is when the, uh, so when I square is equal to zero. So when the, the fundamental ideal of the width ring of uh, quadratic forms, uh, its third power is zero. This is the case, for example, for fields uh, which have cobological dimension less or equal than two. Then in that case, uh, it turns out that you can remove this uh, restriction on the dimension. You can consider all quadratic forms, or all quadratic hypersurfaces up to isomorphism. They are embedded in the Grothendieck ring of varieties. So here you see the, this kind of phenomenon. Some, somehow, uh, quadratic hypersurfaces, as long as you are working on those fields, they are completely insensitive to these cut and past relations. 
And finally, uh, let me just mention one application, application number four. So which is a generalization, an application to uh, evolution varieties. Uh, so here is suppose that you have suppose that you have a, a central simple algebra uh, a but uh, it's equipped with an evolution it's equipped with an evolution star uh, of orthogonal type then in this case um, and once again as usual I'm assuming that the discriminant is trivial. So once again, in this case, I can consider something that is called the involution variety. So I hope that the airplanes are not being uh, very uh, loud. I hope that you're not hearing them. Uh, so you have an involution variety inside of a projective space of dimension the degree of A minus one. And uh, once again, let me give you an example so that you get the feeling uh, about, this, uh, about this variety. So in the particular case where uh, your A is trivial, in other words, it's the matrix algebra, and the involution uh, is uh, the, the uh, adjoint involution of a quadratic form, a non-degenerate quadratic form of dimension, uh, let's say, D, okay? In that case, the involution variety reduces to the quadratic, uh, to the quadratic hypersurface inside the projective space of dimension D minus one. So in other words, when the central simple algebra is trivial, we get the previous examples, the quadratic forms, so these uh, involution varieties, you, you might think of them as being algebraic varieties that are not quad, uh, quadratic hypersurfaces, but when you go to the algebraic closure, they become uh, quadratic hypersurface. So some kind of twisting quadrics. Okay? That's one way to see it. And so the theorem, the same spirit, always in the same spirit, is that we have also in this case, so we have uh, an inclusion uh, so the involution varieties uh, with where the degree, we have this restriction on degree to be equal to six, up to isomorphism, this embeds fully faithfully, sorry, embeds in the Grothendieck ring of varieties. So this theorem, once again, is a far-reaching gener far generalization of this one, uh, of this one here. Okay, this one is the particular case where the central simple algebras are trivial, and this is uh, really much, much stronger. And once again, uh, the same remark applies whenever the third power of the fundamental ideal vanishes, then you can actually embed all uh, involution varieties up to isomorphism in the Grothendieck ring of varieties. Okay. Well, I think I still have one minute, so let me just mention that I hope this gives you a feeling uh, of the gives you a feeling of the power of the of the Jack Titz motivic measure. So it allows actually to to say that this implication, which a priori has no reason to hold, it actually holds in many cases, which is at least for me quite surprising. Okay. Thank you for listening and uh, thank you. So, so uh, thank you very much, Gonzalo, for this beautiful talk. Um, so if anybody has questions, there is still time to put them in the question bar to the right. Um, meanwhile, maybe I could start out by just uh, asking uh, one question that, that occurred to me. So, um, so you have this, uh, this motivic measure and you managed to do all these uh, um, applications of it. So this is actually something that, that is easy to, easy to calculate or what sort of, 
or is it really quite challenging in, in all these examples to to work out? Uh, so what? So what you must you, be able to distinguish things, right? With, with well, yeah, yes, yes. So you you have this uh, somehow uh, um, Jack Titz motivic measure here. Uh, so in these examples, uh, what you are getting is this, the Jack Titz uh, algebras of each one of these twisted projective uh, homogeneous varieties. And then you have to think about these objects in this ring, which is uh, some kind of, a bit strange. Uh, it turns out that uh, what you can actually do is, the, is to, in these examples where you, I always have some kind of restriction on the Brouwer class or on the degree, etc. Uh, you arrive at a situation where you can show that these Jack Titz central simple algebras, uh, uh, they are actually isomorphic. And then in those cases, that information, the Jack Titz central simple algebras, characterize the algebraic variety. In those very particular cases, you have this, what is called in the literature, these exceptional isomorphisms. Okay, and okay. That, so that's why I have these restrictions. On those particular cases, this information completely characterizes the algebraic variety. That's, that's the way to go. Uh, yeah, that's it. But the the technical difficulties to show that in fact this uh, this Jack Titz central simple algebras uh, actually satisfy these uh, Caesar relations. I mean, uh, and for this I use a lot of technology. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. So yeah. So it's, uh, it's highly non non trivial, surely too. Yeah, I mean, okay. if you put all together, it's non-trivial, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you put all the proof okay. together, yes. Um, slightly more philosophical question. So, so how far um, is the the one extreme of uh, of knowing the exact uh, characterization of um, of the limitations of the Grothendieck ring of varieties? Like, could you maybe extend your your measure to other classes of varieties, maybe? Are the homogeneous varieties not necessarily projective? Or uh, I mean, uh, I think what is the challenge? The, there is a bit of challenge there. So, for example, um, if you one thing that you can do is to relax uh, here the algebraic group, not ask it to be, for example, semi simple or things like that. And in that case, you still have. Uh, uh, Jack Titz uh, algebras, but in that case, they will not be central simple algebras. They will not be central. They're, the central will be bigger, so they they will live. So they will be central simple algebras over a certain extension of the base field, and in that case, it's much more difficult to to manage this, this ring to to what to say what does it mean for two elements in this ring to be the same or not. Uh, yeah, in that case, you would be leaving the world of central simple algebras and just working on the world of uh, of, uh, of uh, simple algebras, but not necessarily central, and which is much more difficult to work with. But there is still some work that can be done there. Yes, absolutely. And of course, then uh, yeah, then you can go to stacks, and yeah, you can do other things. So, so can you also uh, maybe get applications of the kind, say, prove uh, Torelli theorem for 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 curves, something like that, uh, with this yeah, kind that, of technology? Uh, Is that a that technology? Uh, I mean, uh, that uh, uh, Torelli theorem. I don't know, but uh, this technology allows you to say. Uh, so, I had no time to talk about this, but for example, here in this application of uh, yeah, in this application here. Yeah, in this theorem here, we actually have this uh, inclusion. But so, for example, if you change the the restriction on A, and you say, for example, that A has a period which is not two, but say three, four, five, or six, for example, low dimensional periods, then you can say that well, if the Brouwer classes are the same, then the Dalsbrek varieties are birational, for example. And there is something called the uh, Amitsur conjecture, something that exists in the literature. And if you put uh, this machinery that I've built it, and if you assume Amitsur's conjecture, then you conclude that uh, whenever a Severi Brouwer variety, whenever two Severi Brouwer varieties are, have the same Grotten D class, they are birational without restriction. So it follows from the Amitsur conjecture. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, this technology allows us to talk about the birationality also. 
Okay. I have no okay. time to talk about that. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, that's very beautiful. Okay. Um, that doesn't don't seem to be any questions right now in the in the question bar. So uh, I think I'll then leave it here. So thank you so much, Gonzalo, again. That was a very beautiful talk. Um, I'm sure thank I certainly you. enjoyed it. I'm sure everybody else did too. Um, and uh, so I was just uh, reminded that I should uh, tell everybody, please don't forget that we have parallel sessions. Um, we have parallel sessions now in the all the various stages so please go to the ones find the ones that are interesting for you and uh, and enjoy uh, the rest of the day the rest of the meeting and so thank you again Gonzalo. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me.